Hello everyone and welcome to the 8th edition of Standard Chartered Wealth Masterclass where our endeavor is to simplify key investment concepts and make investing easy for our viewers. For those of you who have attended the past sessions, recall that over the past year we've covered a host of a host of topics which included understanding asset allocation, uh, decluttering a Kitri portfolio, understanding SEBI categories and how to position for volatility. Today we have an interesting topic, India as long-term structural growth story. Well, India's success in a pre-pandemic recovery has been well documented and quite covered actively in the media. This has also supported India's outperformance over emerging market peers over the past three consecutive calendar years. Now the question is, can India's strong macro fundamentals support Indian market's performance? To understand that better, we have a very special guest amongst us today, Mr. Navneet Panod. Navneet is the MD and CEO of HDFC Asset Management Company. He joined HDFC in February of 2021. A veteran of financial markets, uh, Navneet hosts of three decades of rich experience in the industry. Prior to joining HDFC, he was the executive director and CIO or chief investment officer at SBI Mutual Fund. And he was also director at the board of SBI Pension Funds Limited. Navneet is a qualified chartered accountant and holds a master's degree in accountancy and business statistics. He also holds a charter from the CF Institute and the CI Institute, and he also is a financial risk manager. Navneet, uh, HDFC has been uh, quite vocal about uh, India's growth story and opportunities that uh, are emerging in India. Uh, to understand better, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Ravi. And, and as you rightly mentioned, that <coughs> we have been quite vocal about the growth prospects of India. We have been quite vocal about uh, the opportunities that lies ahead of us over the next uh, uh, couple of decades in India of uh, leading, not only I mean having a higher growth in India, but leading global growth. If we look at last one year and in two slides, I have tried to capture through some of the pictures the world we are in and where India is. The world we are in in the first picture and where India is. And I'm sure everybody will feel after seeing those two pictures like uh, we are at the right time at the right place. If you look at this picture of the world we are in, I think on top left you can see the geopolitical crisis, I think the conflicts in Middle East, uh, the conflict in the heart of Europe, uh, one of the biggest wars since World War II. In fact, because of some of these bigger conflicts, some of the other ones like the, the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia or the coups that have happened uh, in the continent of Africa, um, some of the happenings in other parts of Middle East or even in Latin America don't even get that much of headlines because get so much of what's happening in Europe and, and in some parts of the Middle East. But from a geopolitical perspective, I think we, we really live in a, in a period of heightened uncertainty. Uh, one of the biggest growth driver for the world over the last several decades has been China. But variety of challenges, whether it's policy uncertainty, whether it's a property bubble, whether it's <clears throat> a lack of other growth drivers or, or the higher amount of, of uh, debt in, in many parts of the economy, uh, variety of reasons. And then we know the challenges which are, which are there in China and how are investors looking at China. If you look at markets last year, India's markets were a mirror image of China. I mean, the, growth in MSCI uh, India was like uh, uh, positive and while the Chinese market kind of like dragged the overall returns of the emerging market index and you have seen how several of the global investors have been reviewing their investments or long-term commitments to, to China given the situation there. And of course, now after the Taiwan election, we keep hearing about the heightened risk in this part of Pacific, uh, uh, the geopolitical risk in this part of the Pacific given the rhetoric from uh, from China. If you look at uh, from an economy perspective, let's say uh, the largest economy in the world, US, in 23, they witnessed one of the highest inflation in the last 40 years. We saw interest rates touching a 15 year high. The last time the bond yields were in US Treasury yields were around 4 or 5 percent was in 2007. Uh, we saw the US uh, Federal debt touching uh, at an all-time high, both in terms of absolute levels as well as percentage of, of uh, GDP. And it was not only U.S., but a large part of the developed world saw inflation that 
uh, the world hasn't seen in last uh, four decades. If you look at Europe, of course, I think the kind of challenges they have witnessed, uh, one, because of the geopolitical risk um, uh, and the challenges on the supply chain side, whether it was gas from Russia or grains from Russia, uh, you know, the debate over immigration, the many challenges they have pertaining to infrastructure development in UK, uh, the post-Brexit, I think many other challenges that UK has witnessed. Uh, I'm sure uh, all of you have heard a lot about the challenges that that uh, Europe in general and some of these countries have been facing both on the economy side as well as politics side. Um, and in, in, in the banking sector globally, in the month of March, we saw three uh, banks in U.S. failing. And in fact, in terms of size, they were bigger than the 25 banks that crumbled in 2008. And one of the longest running bank in Switzerland, Credit Suisse, was sold to UBS. So we have seen banking... Uh, <coughs> crisis in U.S. as well as uh, in Europe. Uh, from climate perspective, this was the hottest year in 125,000 years. In fact, I've tried to capture several of these things in, in my annual letter. Uh, from markets perspective, and another market that has become quite big over the last couple of years is the whole uh, crypto market. Of course, the Bitcoin prices were up last year and they've fallen in the last couple of days. But last year, the overall uh, the crypto world had so many, uh, you know, the, the uh, challenges, whether it was the collapse of FTX, Binance, a variety of challenges that the whole crypto world has, has seen. I can go on and on talking about the world we are in and in the world which is uh, geopolitically realigning, a world which is digitally redesigning. In fact, AI has come as like a big opportunity, but also with deep fake and variety of other challenges that it, it, it throws. The world is demographically diverging. A large part of the developed world is, is seeing uh, demographically, uh, the, the, the demographic challenge. And, and now with a um, lot of debate on the immigration, some of the countries have seen uh, labor shortages. The world which is uh, deglobalizing uh, increasingly, I think whether it's the uh, US-China trade war, or in a lot of places, the way supply chains have got disrupted, the world which is deleveraging the amount of debt, public debt that uh, a large part of the developed world has accumulated or China has accumulated over the next several years. They will have to deleverage that balance sheet or, or even the central banks who have accumulated uh, so much of, of reserves to prop up the economy. And since 2008 in particular, but in general over the last 30 years, we have been in a world where we have been told that a cheap money is a solution to every problem, but we have reached a stage uh, where it's going to be increasingly very difficult for policymakers to, to support through incrementally more and more uh, uh, cheaper money. So, I mean, when we look at the world and now I come to the India. So, this is a picture, maybe in one picture, try to show the challenges that the, that the global economy is, is or, or the global so the world is, is facing. Now you look at India and in the next few pictures, I'm pretty sure each one of us will feel very proud to be in India. And as they said, we are at the right time, at the right place. In a highly fragmented and a hyper divided world, uh, India led G20 with a, <coughs> with a slogan uh, of, of our ancient wisdom, Vasudha Kutumkam. The whole planet is our family, the whole world is our family. And and the leadership of the world, whether the political leaders, business leaders, and other society leaders traveled across uh, all the states in India and really saw the energy and enthusiasm of 1.4 billion people. And, and we amplified the inclusion of African uh, Union in the, in the G20. If the global, uh, the world clearly seeing the center of gravity shifting from east to west and from north to south and India is leading from the front. We became the most populous nation during the year. We became the fifth largest economy in the world. We became the fifth largest uh, equity market in the world in terms of market cap. In fact, I'm sure everybody would have read yesterday. We became the fourth largest market in the world and then we beat uh, Hong Kong in terms of market cap. Uh, this was the year where we were on the moon literally. Uh, and then Indian flag was in the, in the, in the south pole of, of moon where nobody has reached before. And of course, now the sun is in sight with, with Aditya. Congratulations to, to our, our, our uh, wonderful people in, in ISRO. Uh, from markets perspective, I talked about the market cap, but in MSCI AM index, uh, our weight reached the highest ever, 16.3%, while China from over 35% came down to 
25%. And FPI flows again post-2020 recorded a high of 1.65 lakh crores. Uh, and both, I think, equity as well as the bond market uh, saw positive flows this year in, in 2023. And it was a big news for India that Indian bonds are now included in the JP Morgan Global Bond Index. And there are various estimates, but ranging from 20 to 30 billion dollars where India can, can attract uh, uh, in its bond market over the next couple of quarters. Our services sector exports continue to grow in a world which is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, digitally redesigned. In a, in a virtual world where uh, everything is, is uh, hyper-connected, I think the talent that India has got, the technology that we have got, and, and the communication <coughs> technology is giving opportunity to many sectors like financial services or legal and many others to, to look at growing our pie in the services sector uh, exports globally. Uh, talking about the external sectors, because of the services sector exports and higher remittances, etc., our current account deficit was in control and then our foreign exchange reserves are back to of $600 billion, which are the fourth largest in the world. Uh, last year, we also got uh, the highest uh, remittances of $125 billion. The taxation reforms have resulted in a substantial increase in, in, in GST revenue as well as the direct tax revenue. And you would have seen like almost every month or alternate month, a number touching a new high on in, in the area of infrastructure. And I call this on a lighter note that India should have got another Oscar for the RRR. And that RRR stands for roads, railways, and renewables. I think both in physical infrastructure and particularly uh, the sustainable infrastructure, uh, uh, whether it's the solar energy, wind energy, transportation, and many sectors, the way we are growing our infrastructure in a highly sustainable manner is, is uh, really path breaking. I mean, then, in fact, I, I showed you some pictures about the news flow and the challenges that some of the Western world is facing on the infrastructure front and now you see the picture about uh, about India. The digital infrastructure surely is world class with UPI record, I mean UPI uh, creating record month after month in terms of uh, number of transactions and now many countries are looking at partnership with India on that front and of course we got 100 medals at, at Asian Games. So this, this really looks like Amrit Kal. So if anybody wants to debate that are we really in an Amrit Kal? Yes, absolutely. This is the second year. And, and when you look at the first year and you see this news flow, and you have to see in the context of what I showed in the first picture, the world we are in, and the challenges that world is facing, whether it's geopolitics, whether it's uh, you know the, the politics or, or, or economically or, or on the social front or on the climate front. And when you see this picture about India, you really feel uh, proud to be, to be an, an Indian. Well, the most heartening part was that uh, the retail investors or the, the domestic investors, how how they are they are participating in this growth story and the SIP numbers kept hitting a newer high almost every month, and now uh, increasingly they are becoming a larger and larger participant in the market. This also provides a lot of stability to our market which in turn helps in, in, in improving the overall macro stability. Historically, we were always told that when when global economy sneezes or when U.S. market snee, uh, sneezes, uh, India gets a fever. This time we saw a lot of other economies facing variety of challenges, but I think our markets remain stable and that's uh, also because of, of the higher participation of domestic investors on a structural basis. Uh, our markets were also less volatile relative to most of the other markets in the world. In fact, both our currency as well as the bond market witness one of the lowest levels of volatility relative to history and relative to all the other markets. So if you compare Indian bond market volatility with, let's say, U.S. Um, uh, US Treasury volatility, our volatility is much lower. And that is thanks to the policy prudence. That is thanks to agile execution. That is thanks to uh, effective communication from policymakers. And of course, uh, because of all of that, the greater confidence of domestic uh, uh, domestic investors. And in, in, in last 30 years of my career in, in financial markets, I would have never imagined this, that India's market cap would touch a new high. And that period will coincide with uh, a lower holding of, relatively lower holding of FPIs. And it would be like uh, largely driven by, by the domestic uh, investors. 
have views on one incremental foreign flows going forward and I'll talk to about I'll talk about it in the next few minutes very briefly there are two or three things that I want to talk about from from India's uh, uh, longer term growth prospect and I thought uh, the, the uh, discussion with Ravi earlier that we focus more on the longer term picture rather than looking at uh, what happens in market in the next few weeks or few months and the first thing I want to talk about when, when we when we talk about a Vixit Bharat or a developed country <laughs> like we have a third world infrastructure on the digital side we can really claim to have a world class or maybe a developed world infrastructure with uh, with the kind of, of digitalization of finance the digitalization of the economy on the taxation side fast tech I can just go on and I'm sure uh, everybody is witnessing this we are very at a very fast pace moving in the direction of creating a world-class infrastructure on the physical infrastructure side uh, it's a lot more visible on as I said on roads railways renewables but we look at the airports ports communication electricity uh, and then almost everywhere uh, we are moving towards uh, at a very very fast pace and I'm sure you have looked at all of that data the infrastructure that we had 10 years back and what we have created in the last 10 years and what we are likely to create in the next uh, 10 years. The third one particularly where India has been criticized a lot uh, for a long time like a poor social infrastructure which is like education, healthcare, sanitation, uh, skill development and all of that but thanks to digitalization and, and, and uh, progressive policies, pragmatic policies, agile execution, uh, participation of, of uh, outstanding entrepreneurs and, 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 and the citizen partnership I think we are moving at a very fast pace in my annual letter person of the year in fact I have mentioned a new age of health tech a new age of healthcare that we are likely to witness over the next uh, uh, several years could be something similar to what we have seen on digitalization of finance or the UPI movement uh, in healthcare and in education maybe uh, it's not very visible today, but maybe in next three, five years, I think we can leapfrog. So what we couldn't achieve for variety of challenges uh, for a very, very long time, I think we can really leapfrog the way we leapfrog in, in, in financial inclusion. So that's on the on the infrastructure side. The second thing uh, that makes us positive about India for next several decades is the long ranging reforms that we have been able to undertake whether it's a monetary policy committee committing towards uh, a four percent and in, uh, uh, inflation a uh, taxation reforms IBC in the banking sector PLI to support manufacturing uh, cutting the corporate tax rate to <coughs> to 25 percent uh, real estate sector era, and I can go off indigenation of, of the defense sector etc reforms the third thing I thought I will highlight this because this is not talked as much as about what India is doing on on creating a very high quality social security net because there are like out of 1.35 1.4 billion people uh, unless we do something to to uh, enhance the ambition and aspirations of a billion people at the, at the at the lower end of the pyramid and there I think India is doing something very very interesting with the help of Aadhaar uh, Jandan Yojana and the mobile phone and ability to deliver these services uh, in, in, in a better manner so I call this India's UBI movement, movement which is like it's not a universal basic income as we know it so don't get me wrong but this is this is something very very unique and that UBI of India is like free toilet, a free LPG cylinder, a basic electricity, a tap water, free LED bulb and, and then you know the uh, the food drain to, to uh, 800 million people and then you know the health insurance, the housing for all and the pension and Sukhanya Samriddhi and so on and so forth. This is very interesting because to, to build consumption in the long run and get another 700-800 million people into the uh, what we call TAM, the total addressable market for various categories. This is very very critical. This is this is not talked about as much when people think about the the economic reforms and the other things. What all of this will do? If I look at the IRS, the I for infrastructure, the the R for the reforms, and the S is what we are doing social security net. What the result of all of this would be? One of course the ease of living for our citizens and enhancing the productivity of people. And second is the ease of doing business, which kind of promotes more entrepreneurship over a, over a period of time, a lead to many more global businesses to set up businesses in India or expand in India, and the domestic entrepreneurs investing move. What it does is with the with the fiscal reforms, 
and the monetary policy reforms, they provide macroeconomic stability. With more and more formalization of the economy, which is linked with the digitalization, and as we make it more transparent, automatically the tax revenues go up. And with that, the fiscal picture uh, improves. So formalization of economy, not only good for the entrepreneurs, but also improves the overall fiscal uh, uh, health of the, of the economy. It's good because investment is critical to, to drive growth. So two pillars of investment, consumption, investments, and in fact, the third pillar, uh, exports as well, we are on the services sector, we are doing well, but as we get plumbed into global supply chain over a period of time, can, can aspire to do better on the goods export as well. But consumption and investment, the two big pillars of the growth, uh, all of these reforms and better, as I said, productivity should, should augur well for consumption and investment, I think from a low base, uh, over a period of time, the overall gross capital formation should start going up. The other way to look at it from a growth perspective, I think the all three uh, cylinders, whether services, manufacturing through the PLI, automation, and some of the other things, over a period of time, manufacturing should improve. In fact, we did this uh, defense fund a couple of uh, months back, and then you can see, I mean, how that sector has, has uh, I don't know, it done well with the with the more and more uh, localization of, of production and the and the higher orders. Same thing with various other parts of the of the manufacturing. We have a very, I mean, on a relative basis, uh, the manufacturing is a smaller part of the economy relative to most of the our, our peers when they were at this stage of growth. Have a lot of potential, and of course, over a period of time. Maybe with digitalization and some of the other efforts, agriculture can also grow and India can become a reliable uh, uh, food basket. So, I mean, the uh, food supplier of the of the world. In fact, the one particularly I would like to highlight on services is the tremendous potential that we get as tourism. As India becomes a bigger and bigger soft power, as we become more clean, as we build more infrastructure, and given the the uh, various, uh, I would say, things that, that India has to offer to the world, we become a much bigger power from a tourism perspective. And all of this also leads to financialization of savings as people have more confidence in investing into, uh, into capital markets over a period of time. This makes it more self-sustaining uh, virtuous cycle where savings get converted into investments. Investments leads to higher growth, which in turn create jobs and people make more money. They consume more, they save more. When they save more, they invest more. We get into that that uh, virtuous cycle. So I thought maybe a more longer term, what I expect over the next uh, uh, couple of decades, in fact, title this as, as the Amrit Khan period between 22 and 47 for 25 years. Now, I know that, uh, Ravi, uh, I mean, whenever you talk about the long term, a good picture, but still the question always is last way, some discussion on ke baad market kya lagta hai, because people remain uh, as focused on that. Uh, of course, whenever people ask this question and, and there is a tendency to look at some of the recent events or, or maybe the near term uh, earnings growth or, or, or a near term you know, the news flow on the macro side or maybe a union budget is coming and then people start giving views based on that. Generally, my framework has been that when somebody asks market, I have to look at four things. Number one is the macro. I think I've already talked a lot about, about the macro. I think I feel very positive about, about the macro situation in India, both uh, whether it's a monetary policy uh, or the fiscal policy combined, the growth inflation dynamics, the balance sheets of corporate sector and the financial sector has never been in as good a shape in the last maybe uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, I think whichever we have an external account, I talked about the CAD or, or the BOP, so on and so forth. So macro looks good, but we need to keep in mind the global risk on the macro. I mean, if there is a <clears throat> hard lending in US, if the geopolitical risk kind of turns out to be uh, worse than what is anticipated today. I think any of those risks can can impact India's macro also. While we may have decoupled to some extent, but we remain quite, I would say, linked with the global economy in some or the other manner. Through the trade channel, through flows channel, uh, through various channels, I think there would be some impact on India, though relatively at, in the, through a lesser uh, a degree. The second thing I look at after macro is the corporate profitability. And there, I mean, rather than looking at just quarter on quarter, I'll just show one chart that corporate profits, and this is like all listed companies in India, corporate profits as a percentage of GDP does the high of close to 7% in 2007-8. And from there, they had like a uh, 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 decline to like a low of almost like 2% or so. And from there on in last three years, 
Uh, we have seen an increase of uh, four point. Now it's at four point eight. But from a longer term perspective, I think we have seen a high of of seven also. So if we have a decent growth, like growth currently seven percent, but if you assume over the next couple of years. Uh, a seven percent or so growth. You add four percent of inflation. If you have, let's say, an eleven percent or so of nominal GDP growth, and corporate sector profit as percentage of GDP do slightly better than that, then profit growth can be like low, uh, uh, low double digit. Yeah. So the first was macro. The second, this is my framework. And somebody asked, "Bazaar, kya lagta hai?" The third is the valuations, and and there it's like uh, little, uh, I would say, uh, tricky because as, as you can clearly see, uh, the valuations when we look at Nifty in terms of PE is is uh, higher than the long term average. Uh, of course, it has come off a bit, but still, I mean, it's not as high as what we saw two years back, but still. On the higher side, at 20 times plus, our premium to MSCI EM index has been uh, on the higher side, much higher than the long-term average. But again, we have to see in the context that a large part of the emerging markets, and when we saw earlier that almost a quarter of that is China, uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty and not doing well, we have to see in that context, and that's why those markets are quite cheaper. From a market cap to GDP, the another uh, uh, data that we look at, it has come off from a high of. 120 uh, percent or so, but still at at 100 percent, slightly higher than the than the average. But the the uh, valuations are are uh, relatively on a large cap side are are uh, not so expensive the way they are on the mid cap as well as on the small cap side. And I'm sure you hear that from all our fund managers. Uh, Chirag uh, did a call few days back, and I think he made the same point. There are relative basis. Large caps looks more uh, attractive uh, relative to the mid and 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 then small cap. In fact, I okay maybe in the in the liquidity uh, when I talk about. So the framework, as I said, the macro where the corporate profit direction, where the valuations are, and last but not the least is is the uh, liquidity and the sentiments. There, I thought I'll talk about the flows. I mean, the demand of money and the supply of money. The supply of money comes from foreign investors. And the domestic investors, foreign investors, were a large buyer of of equity last year. Over the last uh, 25 or 30 years, data if you look at foreign portfolio investors would have been a so let's say 21 out of 25 years or maybe 26 out of 30 years, foreign portfolio investors would have been a net buyer of Indian equities uh, for mainly two reasons. Number one. They like India from a top-down perspective. A structural growth story, starting from a very low base, low penetration, uh, uh, policy certainty, structural reforms, and then and, and the overall growth opportunity that India offers relative to a lot of other markets. So that was one reason, top-down. The bottom-up opportunity of creating a portfolio of high-quality companies, uh, good growth prospects. I on corporate governance, good disclosures, so on and so forth. So because of that, you see uh, foreign portfolio investors, as I said, 25 or 26 out of last 30 years have been net buyer of Indian equities. And now the third dimension that has got added for them, which is positive for them, is the rise of domestic investors. As domestic investors become large. They provide a lot of liquidity to the market. They increase the depth of the market. We should logically give even more comfort to the global investors to deploy more money in India because they can clearly see that whenever they used to sell, uh, the market impact used to be very high and the impact cost has come down. So on a, on a risk-adjusted basis, the attractiveness of India for them should, over a period of time, I'm not talking about next one quarter or two quarter. They'll be driven by many factors, but should actually go up. Uh, bigger thing which we talked about earlier, how the SIP flows have become very structural and then continues to grow. The number of demand accounts, number of MF unique investors, and I think this is just beginning of financialization of savings in India. So the supply of money now, of course, last year's supply of money was much greater than the demand of money, which is like. The new primary issuance uh, that happened, of course, it was a, a good year for the number of IPOs. But from the amount that was raised versus the money that came in from 
all the investors was much higher and that's why we have seen a positive so in next one year maybe i think over a period of time as 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 this money flow increases from from investors epa for investing on a structural basis sip flows are there nps and insurance flows are there and foreign portfolio investors commit larger money one would expect that there would be many much more supply of of paper as well to to absorb that money there are few pockets of exuberance when we talk about the the liquidity and the sentiments in the market i'm sure of talked about, i mean uh, uh, often talked about uh, what's happening in the in the sme market 100 times average over subscription 40% or so average listing gains uh, if you look at the volumes in, in that market and sometimes you get a little worried looking at some of that data the fndo volumes the way they have increased i mean despite the fact the cb study that um, cb study on on the uh, on the ninety percent investors lose money in F and O, but you see the the increase in in, in the volumes there. Uh, I think if you look at derivatives to cash ratio, I think India completely stand out relative to most of the other other markets in the world. So of course there are there there are like few pockets of of these like super ends. So if I go back and you ask me market kya lagta, I think from a macro perspective I feel positive, but but global situation one needs to keep an eye on on corporate profitability i think from a longer term perspective 3 5 years and 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 beyond if the nominal gdp continues to grow at uh, uh, you know 11 12% and then profits can grow at a higher pace valuations are are richer uh, because of the positive macro as well as the uh, the rising corporate profitability but more at the at the uh, <laughs> Bit and small cap than than in the in the in the large caps. Liquidity and sentiments, as I said, that given that overall environment around India has been positive, and then that's why uh, the, the the sentiments are positive on India. But we need to keep an eye on what's happening uh, globally. Now the interesting part is I've talked about India and the markets. I just thought I'll I'll show you this that a tale of two cities. There are many countries that have gone through higher growth, but there are very few countries which have been able to convert. a high economic growth into high consistent corporate profit growth which could in turn get converted into market capitalization growth now look at china china has done phenomenally well in last 20 years from an economic growth perspective but the market has hardly deliver any return and look at india where i think market has like almost 25x in last 20 years uh, from a sensex perspective so gdp growth could be Uh, was equal to corporate profit growth was equal to market cap growth because of the of the of the the growth which was driven by the entrepreneurs where corporates could could convert that economic growth into corporate profits and a and a capital market infrastructure and a mutual fund industry where even with a thousand rupee per month SIP somebody could could participate in that. Now how do you write this Amrit Kaur over the next twenty twenty five years? I'm sure. everybody knows the markets will definitely not deliver these returns in a linear fashion you will have a ride like this and we know that large number of investors who try to time it are not able to to make money the best way would be like to have sound investment plus time and plus patience I can give an example of how that has played the power of compounding over the last 30 years or so in in 29 years of uh, since its inception A ten thousand rupee SIP in flexi cap has become fifteen crores. Now, surely I must say this: as we say, past performance is not a guarantee of, or not an indicator of future performance. This was a different era. Maybe inflation was higher, rates were higher, but it just shows the power of compounding. It just shows the power of disciplined uh, investing. And in this period of twenty nine years, there have been like many ups and downs. And here we have tried to show only the large fall that. market has seen at various point in time so money has got multiplied 160 times but that has seen many fall of over 20 30 when as i as 50 and 60% fall and somebody who had the patience has been able to to get these returns uh, the another thing we keep getting asked is like market is at all time i what to do and what we have tried to do in this chart is uh if let's say somebody was very unlucky and only invested when market was at an all time high whether it was in 94 whether it was in in, in the february 2000 or or the uh january or or february of 2008 uh in in 2010 in 2015 or so and and maybe the covid period and 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 going back so the idea is that 
even if you invested at an all time high and just held on to it for a longer period you still got decent returns and of course the better way would have been to to invest in a disciplined manner the same thing i mean i i showed many points in the previous chart but this is like if somebody invested at the peak of the market and the market fell sharply over the next uh, one month in 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 covid and in march 20 or or over the next nine months from jan to october 2008 or or over the next three years between 2000 and 2003 but if you held on to that fund i think your returns have been uh, uh, pretty pretty decent so i would just say that the best way to play india's amrit kal is remember the stp sound investment plus time plus plus uh, patience uh, i mean of course i could have put a lot of data and charts and and information but uh, i think i didn't do that and then ensure that i i i try to convey that <coughs> a more longer term message this is the last slide on our website you can see our year book you get this for of charts and information on economy markets on 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 everything and it has a lot of quotes from from uh, legendary investor uh, charlie munger and i thought of picking this one it's waiting that helps you as an investor and a lot of people just can't stand to wait Uh, he also said that some other time it's not buying, it's not selling, it's awaiting that that makes you money. And I thought I'll I'll leave you with uh, with with that thought and and the final formula for wealth creation, repeating even at the cost of uh, repeating uh, sound investment plus time plus patience is the best way to ride the Amrit Kal. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Navneet. Uh, the presentation and the articulation of view was uh, impeccable. Uh, as always uh, great speaking to you but uh, you know we've spoken about uh, the positives that we've seen and seem to be riding on for the last 3 years clearly uh, the media and investors they they do uh, you know, uh, subscribe to that view but there have been some pockets of uh, disconnect uh, especially when you look at uh, india's trajectory over the past few decades we've seen this uh, scenario or, or something very similar cycle in the early 2000s which continued uh, all the way up to gfc where quite a few parameters uh, were looking strong when we looked at credit growth gdp growth india's investment cycle but can india continue that so that four year five year surge that we've seen in the past like in order to to reach where we want to reach uh, to become the uh, within the top 3 uh, you know global powers in terms of market cap and gdp you need the strong growth momentum to continue for some years and not just these small 4 5 year cycle now, i think there was a, a technical glitch uh, because of which navneet has got disconnected uh, we'll just give it a minute uh, and navneet will log in back just bear with me for a while while navneet is still logging in uh, maybe i can take a few questions is it good to have sip in flexi cap small cap and mid cap large cap together well uh, th this is best answered uh, by looking at your overall asset allocation it's always good to start having a, a good asset allocation and then join and then when start selecting funds uh, wherever you see a gap uh navneet is back uh, after the i i really sorry i don't know what what no. happened on <laughs> yeah no problem so uh, so a, a few questions on the chat box uh, do highlight some concerns that people have yeah. you know uh, you know they uh, they they compare the current cycle in india uh, the strong one uh, you know yeah. to, uh, to a very similar cycle in the early 2000s before and no absolutely no that that, that uh, we have seen earlier historically of course in last 30 years india has, has grown reasonably well uh our, our rankings have been inching up but i think that the difference this time in fact uh, i used to say that there are four d uh, that makes me positive on india our democracy our demographics our demand and digitalization the fifth d that i have added now to these four d is the determination i don't think i think uh, we have been as determined to do well as as we are now and i think there's a big difference that i i see in india when you meet entrepreneurs i think you meet people from various sections of the society and particularly those ones who are coming from smaller towns smaller villages i think the aspirations that they have the hunger that they have to do well is very different and that makes me relatively more positive and also the overall work that uh, policy makers have done on ensuring macroeconomic stability whether it's a monetary policy committee framework i think our commitment on on improving the fiscal uh, situation through direct benefit transfer the gst reform so you you balance the tax revenues and 
and you you spend more on building capital assets and then not the uh, uh, revenue expenditure. I think some of these things make you relatively more positive. Um, if as I keep mentioning a couple of times that if something goes wrong globally, of course it will impact India, but it will impact India to a lesser degree relative to what used to happen in, in every cycle earlier. But we need to keep or anything I'm sure that can that can also have its, its its role. So we need to be like very careful that we have a long stand and then we may have become among the top five but on per capita GDP we are still one of the lowest and we need to do a lot more. Sure. Uh, Navid, just uh, a, a related question so we'll quickly start clubbing a few broader questions. Uh, there are questions on uh, the opportunities uh, because India is going to invest a lot in infra, uh, you know, the challenges that we will face on renewable energy or sustainable energy and also, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, traction that people are witnessing in the defense sector. So your overall view on these three broad, uh, you know, areas, if you could just spend a couple of minutes. No, overall, I, I think the, the challenges that let's say manufacturing sector historically had the, the factors of, of uh, production, whether it's the uh, land, labor, power, logistics, all of that. As we improve our infrastructure, I think it's it's uh, better and better for the for the manufacturing sector, right? I think if the logistics improve in the country, it is, it's good for them. The cost of power comes down as, as we supply more reliable and a cheaper energy. It's good for the manufacturing. A lot of other reforms that have happened in terms of whether it's a PLI or, or the indigenation or production in some of the sectors are uh, the greater is spent by the government uh, on the capex i think augurs well for the overall all print uh, cycle so those sectors are are likely to do well on the consumption side the so called like k shaped recovery where we have seen you know the higher growth in, in urban versus rural or higher growth in premium versus mass consumption or higher growth in, in uh, formal versus the informal sector. I think incrementally things should start improving on, on that front also. And I mentioned about uh, one of the things that I feel very positive about the longer term consumption growth is the high quality social security net that, that India is investing in. So there, there are opportunities uh, across. I think uh, it, it depends a lot more on come up with stock picking rather than only taking a top down call and you identify the right entrepreneurs who are building the moat and building the competitive uh, you know uh, advantage for others who can deliver good returns to investors thanks to meeta i'll just quickly come to another couple of related questions uh, a lot is being uh, written and uh, spoken about AI uh, and then you know, chat GPT as a new thing. And you mentioned in your presentation that uh, it, it opens up challenges uh, and has been, along with a lot of opportunities. Uh, Indian, uh, the IT sector has not uh, seemed to have benefited with that development as has been the case in US and you know, some, uh, you know, in, in some Asian markets. Uh, what are the challenges that the current IT sector is facing and you see that uh, helping us at some point in improving uh, trans transformations and uh, maybe reducing cost efficiencies? No, it's too early to say that. In fact, it can lead to a lot of cost efficiency. I think if they leverage the power of space at which it's, it's evolving, I think there will be a lot of opportunities for the IT sector. One, I think on, on, on the on the greater uh, integration of AI into everything on their client side and on the other side, reducing the cost of, of delivering that. So there would be opportunities. I think there are IT industry over the last 30 years, there have been many moments where, where people kind of uh, thought that it was like one of, you remember the Y2K movement or some of the other times when the infrastructure moved from on-prem to cloud and people thought that no large part of the revenues came from managing that versus this is a different world and so forth but we have seen how capabilities have got built so I, I remain confident so again i mean not that everybody would be a beneficiaries a beneficiary but there would be players who are investing right and who are who are trying to be on the disrupting others rather than getting disrupted i think uh, a larger i would say 
but not only for the IT sector, but across uh, many other businesses where AI is going to be a transformation force. Uh, you want to be a disruptor and not in the, in the, in the league who, who we get disrupted. Right. Now, Rita, a lot of uh, questions in the chat box uh, relate to two broad types of uh, investors. One who just entered the employment pool and started to earn a salary. How does he prepare versus somebody who's in maybe hasn't uh, invested so far and is in the early 50s or late 40s? How does he prepare uh, for the retirement corpus that he has in mind? What would be your, your suggestion sure. for them? So, of course, I think those who are early and, and relatively they have greater risk appetite because of the earning potential that they have, their economy which is growing with, with better prospects over a period of time. And if they have the, so the time is on their side, as we keep saying, I think the best way to create wealth over a long period of time is start early, invest regularly. So those youngsters can, if they have the ability to start very early and, and on a very lighter note, I mean, we, it's a lot of people say about this generation that they believe in zindagi na milegi dobara and let's spend and let's 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 uh, spend more on the experience. But I know, I mean, you can see the number of, of demand accounts or the number of investors SIPs that we get from millennials and Gen Z. I think they are equally focused on 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 right kind of investing as well over a period of time. And uh, I think that would be the right way. 40s, 50s, again, a lot of people think that it's kind of like I have limited time, but the longevity is increasing. I got into the average life expectancy was around mid 30s. Now that would be maybe early 70s or mid 70s, and it's only going to increase in the next 10 or 20 years. We still have a lot of time to accumulate. I mean, if you look at the Warren Buffett, I gave the example of Char I, I talked about Charlie Munger, and in our annual yearbook, we have we have made a lot of mention to him. And 99 percent of his wealth would have been accumulated after he turned 50. So I think we still have a lot of time to to compound. Yeah, uh, let me just one final question, and before we close up, what are the, the the top three themes or top three sectors that you feel are going to be uh, beneficial of the current transition that India is currently in? Uh, top three themes or sectors which you think. Uh, that you are like to yeah, almost everything because we talked about the infrastructure in detail. We talked about. We talked about the uh, investment cycle in detail. I mean, we, we have seen uh, in the last 10, 15 years, I think the overall investment as a percentage of GDP or the cross capital formation as a percent of GDP had fallen and started rising. I think it's a, it's a long cycle driven by government capex at this point in time to be followed by, by higher private capex over a period of time. Household capex remains strong, particularly on the on the real estate. So there are like a lot of opportunities, there is capital goods, engineering, real estate, and so on and so forth. But again, you have to see what is priced in and what is what is not. I think that is that is more important than only looking at the top down. And then as I mentioned that starting from a low base at twenty five hundred dollars per capita, there are many categories which will have a J curve after hitting a, a certain point in the per capita, given the large population that uh, that we have as that pyramid changes. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you that our, our demographics today is very similar to what China was in 98, 99. Of course, China had a one-child policy before that, and that's why the maybe evolution was different, but ours won't be dramatically uh, different than that. And then in next 20 or 30 years, the cohort that will increase the most of the people who are in 40s, where do they spend money? What do they do uh, in their life? It is also the age where they save and invest a lot. They start getting a lot more concerned of particular about their retirement and about their their investing so i think capital markets are going to be a big beneficiary of of uh, of that trend thanks a lot uh, uh, navneet you've been uh, very patient and you've uh, taken all the questions well the presentation was great it gave us a, a, a you know a, a high level view of what to expect uh, from the india's long term structural growth story thank you for taking time out from your busy schedule uh, we won't hold you back uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Really my pleasure. Thank you so much. This uh, brings us nearly to the close of the webinar. Uh, uh, as uh, Navneet uh, logs out, what we'll do is we'll play a short video uh, for you to understand what our SC Invest capability is, the digital infrastructure on which you can log in 
and access uh, uh, various publications that we release on a regular basis and also how it can help you start investing seamlessly and efficiently. Want to invest but still figuring out how to start, where to invest or whose guidance to follow? How about an investment tool that brings together industry leading solutions in one place? Presenting Standard Chartered Invest, your one-stop online investment shop. What does it do for you? Well, for starters, there's no paperwork to open an investment account. And if you're confused about where to start investing, just tap to view our pre-generated SIP packs based on your risk appetite. Not just that, you can get theme-based fund ideas too as per your investment needs. With comprehensive market insights at your fingertips, now you can easily keep track of the markets and get access to detailed reports. So that you can make informed investment decisions, monitor the performance of your investments and realign them as per your convenience. And no matter where you are, transact on the go while having complete control of your investments in your hands. View all your holdings, buy new funds and do a lot more with your SIPs too. You can pause or cancel your SIPs whenever you want or resume as well as redeem them anytime as per your wish. All this and a host of other benefits just waiting for you to explore on SC Invest. Get set invest today. Simply log into online banking or the SC mobile app. Download now. Thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, we will connect back next month again uh, at a very similar setting with another industry veteran and with an interesting topic. Thank you for, once again for joining us.